hi, I'm Rosemary Thornburgh and I am working um, at the National Museum of Royal Navy, um, looking after HMS Victory, or trying to. <laughs> um, I'll just uh, start off, I'm sure you all know this, but um, it was built um, from 1759 to 65. Um, based on um, designs developed uh, actually from English and also French um, uh, shipping designs. Um, it was first rate ship, which means it was in the first line of attack on the sea. Um, it was by Samuel Nelson's uh, ship during the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, but it was commanded by Captain Hardy, so that's two sort of iconic figures there. Um, uh, Nelson uh, died during the battle and um, he um, was set down on the Orlock deck uh, to sort of have his final moments with his crew crowded around him and Captain Hardy and he passed away and his body was uh, preserved in a barrel of brandy to keep it fresh and brought, to, brought home on the Victory and then transferred from where the Victory docked to a barge and brought up the River Thames to Greenwich. Anyway, um, so that was his last trip home. Um, the, vi the Victory itself was um, repaired. It had various different repairs, um, but uh, I'll come on to that a bit more in a minute. Um, but it's still maintained as a flagship of the Royal Navy under the first sea lord. So there's still a big like Royal Navy presence there. Um, and uh, it was looked after the MOD until 2012, when it was entrusted to the HMS Victory Preservation Trust and the National Museum of the Royal Navy. Um, so, um, basically, uh, the vessel um, went through various modifications um, as the uh, Royal Navy ships were um, being developed to keep up with the French Navy ships. Um, there was various different um, modifications going on. Um, and uh, uh, Robert Seppings, um, uh, set about uh, enclosing the bar, the front of the ship, as, as one of the modifications, which I'll show you a slide in a minute. Um, but apart from that, it, it just couldn't keep up. It was a 1750s design coming up to the 1820s, and, and it just couldn't keep up with more modern ships. So by the 1820s, there was calls to scrap the vessel, but there was a public outcry. Um, and apparently Captain Hardy's wife took exception to it as well. Um, so because of what it represented to them in the 1820s at the time. So um, Victory um, <coughs> was where Nelson died. Uh, Nelson had been absolutely lauded as the savior of Britain against the struggle ongoing against France. So it was regarded now as a shrine and this um, early 1900s um, postcard names it the Shrine of the Navy. So um, it was seen as the Board of Admiralty's duty to preserve the vessel um, as a memorial to Nelson and to sort of the memory of the great British victory and those days of sail. Um, so uh, the commencement of Victory as a museum came about um, from uh, 1891. Uh, Victory was basically docked off Portsmouth, it's close to the Gosport actually, and was used as a trading ship. Um, but uh, by the 1900s, she was in a very poor state. So um, the Board of Admiralty um, took experts from the Society of Nautical Research to um, try and come up with a way to restore the vessel. And um, uh, a lot of money was uh, raised at that point. 
Um, so I was saying earlier to, to David there, there's, there's nothing like a Jeopardy situation to help raise money, um, a bit like the Notre Dame situation at the minute. Um, so by 1922, the Save the Victory Fund was established. Some modifications again uh, occurred. So um, in the left-hand uh, slide, basically, we can see that the second um, bow is still there, and it's completely enclosed. Um, and that dates from 1814, 15 or so. But they stripped all that 19th century material off and, and redid the um, decorative bow as, as it would have been in 1805. And, you know, possibly didn't record it archaeologically, let's say. Um, also, the other thing that happened was um, it, it wasn't strong enough any longer to, to be sitting in water, so it was docked in this number two dock, which is an 1800s um, dock in the Portsmouth Historic Dockyard. And the dock was um, emptied of water, and the, the ship was sat on these big steel cradles um, that were complete by 1923. When um, King George VI came to visit, in 1924-25, um, it was fitting lower than, than it would have been sat on the water. So he, all he said was he looked at it in store, apparently, and said, get her up. Um, basically, he didn't like how it was sitting at the lower gun ports, only just above. And it, it, you know, he just didn't like it. And so, you know, the, the Victory Fund also didn't like it. So. In 1925, they re-flooded the dock three times, put chocks in, and um, extended the steel cradles underneath to, to achieve this um, higher um, position. But um, uh, with no sort of, not too much concern about how it would stress the ship by putting it up higher. Um, but there are that we've got documents like letters and um, correspondence from, from the 1920s back and forth saying, well, how is this going to affect the ship? And they're like, well, if the king locks it up, we're just going to have to do that sort of thing. Um, so even from that point, they were questioning, really, should we be doing this? Um, internally, um, because of a famous 1807 painting by Arthur Davis or Davis that shows Nelson's final moments on this part of the Orlock, um, he had drawn or painted structural elements of the ship in certain positions. And in order for the visitors to witness exactly how it was in the painting, they actually compromised the structural pieces of the vessel, the, the knees and um, the supports of the beam above. Um, they actually moved them um, in order to match what it should look like in the painting. So that's like, it might have started to weaken the structure, but they didn't mind because it looked more like a painting. So that's another interpretative um, quirk there. <laughs> Um, but the painting on board was a copy of one held in the National Museum in Greenwich. But, um, also, some interesting pieces, even right up to 2012, they have very significant um, artifacts kept on board the ship. For example, this is actually a slide from an American family's visit in 2012 to the vessel, where they saw an original piece of the foremast with a cannonball hull sustained during the 1805 Battle of Trafalgar. This, this piece of, um, you know, mast is really, really significant because it's got tangible evidence of that battle. Um, and uh, it was presented to uh, King William, um, you know, uh, in the 19th century after the battle is a real piece of, yes, this is proof that, you know, we, we won against France. And here it is, that on the victory, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, ooh, uh, 
is, is a, an issue. And also the top sail, again, with cannonball holes in it, um, uh, was very, very fragile. And it's, um, it used to be displayed right on board, hanging up, but still, you know, just sustaining more damage just by hanging there. But anyway, since, um, uh, since the 2014 reinterpretation, valuable artifacts like this have been taken off the ship and displayed separately. Um, basically, the ship is, is riddled with damp, um, rot, uh, fungal problems, you know, death watch beetle also. So we don't want to keep some valuable artifacts on board to be eaten alive. Um, and also, you know, there's a lot of um, furniture and things that have been um, uh, acquired into the collection by um, really generous donations, but we're, um, we're trying to separate now the generous donation facsimile furniture from the genuine, uh, you know, Lord Nelson, like, pieces we've we've taken the nelson pieces off and they're again being stored separately but we keep you know some less valuable pieces on board as set dressing and things um no and also we've removed a lot of signage and things we have an audio guide system in place but it's it's very intermittent <laughs> But the, the sort of in reinterpretation was to strip back signage and, and other like more antiquated museum approaches and try and you know get it to a less cluttered, more genuine appearance. Um, the exterior presentation, this is number two dot without any ship in it. Um, and I just want it because I really like that slide. <laughs> So I found that image the other day at the National Archives. These are the 1920s uh, um, cradles that hold the ship up that um, we're currently stripping out because um, the ship has sagged between the cradles because the, the, the hull um, is so soft. So um, we're putting in these new supports which means um, we're working um, with engineers and all sorts. And um, you know, I've enjoyed watching at one o'clock in the morning when they're cutting these out, because I'm making sure they don't burn the ship down while the hot work, so carry on. And, but when it's all stripped out, it should be much more back to a nice open space under the ship. Oh, good grief, I'm really running outside. So there's all types of audiences. Um, so basically, um, we've got enthusiasts for Royal Navy. There's still a lot of Royal Navy visitors. We get loads of foreign tourists, like a lot of French school parties, and they're not they're not bothered too much about. Um, okay, to some people, the victory represents a victory against France. They're more like seeing beyond it as, oh, this is a genuine ship. It's a very British item. Let's tick it off the list of British sites to go and see. And they're more interested in um, the, the plastic bleeding foot we've got in the surgeon's area. Like they're learning about other aspects. And we're trying to move it away from being a shrine to the Navy. The other very important thing is, there's a lot of um, low income communities right on the doorstep of the dockyard. Um, there's big dockyard gates, but they're so foreboding that um, people don't realise you can actually just, you can't, you can't get your bag checked, but you can just go in for free and see everything from the exterior for free. But it wouldn't occur to them. They just think, oh, you must pay it the £40 and we can't afford it. So a lot of local people think it's not for them. So we're trying to improve all that. The other thing is the um, the disability, the mob mobility impaired people who, who, it's a long walk from the entrance gates all the way to Victory, plus all the cobblestones. There's little um, trolleys that take people to the Mary Rose Museum, but not to the Victory. So we, we need some joined off thinking there. Um, Partnership working, just, oh my gosh, I'm running over probably, but um, 
So we've got curators. I'm trying to teach curators about um, archaeological archiving. Like um, somebody accessioned all these plastic ships biscuits. So now all of them have fines number. You know, I mean, we're trying to sort of get everything a bit more back to how it should be. Possibly, I'm writing HIAs so that every time the engineers want to cut something out, I've backed up why we don't need to keep every single piece of wood, which is why those pieces can be sold or given away. But I'm also, we don't want to sell anything anymore um, like that. It's just a bit wrong. Um, but um, I don't like that we're working with the shipwrights who sort of will blatter away at things unless I say, well, hold on a second, have you thought about doing this instead? So we're, we're trying to drag the NMRL kicking and screaming into a sort of archaeologically sympathetic way of working, but where we realise we don't have to preserve every link, every single shard of, of the victory. Um, is it original? Well, it's like any historic um, uh, structure. It's, you know, it represents a, an ongoing story. Um, is, is it relevant? Well, maybe the local, <coughs> local low-income people might say, no, it's not relevant, but actually probably a lot of their families might have served in the Navy, so it, it can be relevant, and it kills a lot of time when you've got screaming kids. You can just go <laughs> and destroy it. And then my daughter, okay, she's probably biased, but I said, you know, is it worth spending the money? A bit like the Notre Dame thing, and she said, Yes, because it's old and we can still learn from it, so hooray! <laughs> <laughs>